Okay, let's back up a little bit to where we had the equation that had already been spatially discretized, but before we had chosen to time discretize. So again, this is our matrix equation. And we haven't chosen whether to evaluate this p at time step n or n plus 1. And our choice there gives us either an implicit or explicit method. So this equation <coughs> should be obvious, has units of pressure. So for example, pounds per square inch in uh, English units field units. Um, that's obvious, you know, if you just look at the right-hand side, um, this PB, uh, the, just uh, the entries in there, if you remember, would be something like 2 eta PB, where PB is a pressure. Uh, eta is, a, is dimensionless. It's a dimensionless parameter. So obviously, uh, this has units of, of pressure. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply, we're going to modify this equation a little bit. We're going to start by multiplying on the left. We're, when we're talking about matrix multiplication, it matters uh, if you multiply it on the left or the right. So we're going to multiply on the left by a matrix B. Um, I'll show you what B looks like in a second. Uh, rather, 1 over delta T, B. So if we do that, then of course we get 1 over delta T B because B times the identity matrix is just B. And so B is a matrix. It's actually just a diagonal matrix that has the volume of the ith grid block so I guess Go ahead and write the zero grid block there, the first one here. And so on. So B has a form like that. And uh, if you look at what these terms represent, uh, they actually re represent the accumulation of fluid due to increasing or decreasing pressure within the grid block. And so this is the volume of the, of the, you know, the ith grid block. And then you have the porosity, um, the total compressibility, and the formation volume factor. We'll talk about what the formation volume factor does in a second. But this B matrix we're going to call the accumulation matrix because, again, the terms there represent uh, the, the accumulation of uh, fluid in a reservoir due to change in pressure. <coughs> um, now, this guy 
we're going to relabel as T. And you know, any um, you know, T is going to have the form because we're multiplying a diagonal matrix times the A matrix, which uh, you know just has the coefficients in it. Um, would look something like, and you know, we'll ignore the first row because that's to do with the boundary conditions. But one, what we'll say is minus t, two t, minus t, zero, uh, minus t, two t, minus t, and so on, like that. Where t, uh, that is the constant the, that appears in the matrix, is equal to K A I mu B alpha delta X. <coughs> so um, that's actually just the result of, you know, we've, we've defined B. So if you were to then, you know, recognize that, you know, B has a volume in it, but the volume of the ith grid block uh, can also be written as the cross-sectional area of the ith grid block times delta x times the length of the grid block. So if you make that substitution in for b, and then you also expand the definition of eta, then you can cancel uh, some terms, and ultimately you end up with this. And this t is the transmissibility. So that's from Darcy's law. This is the amount of fluid flow into or out of a grid block. Okay. Uh, the last thing we're going to do is, you know, this term on the right-hand side that has to do with the boundary conditions. Um, we're going to relabel that this whole matrix or vector rather. Um, you know, you have a, a diagonal B matrix times a vector will give you another vector. Uh, and so we're going to relabel this Q, okay? And the purpose of this guy, or this whole process, was to convert this equation into something that has units of rate, right? So, in, for example, in, in SI, it could be cubic feet per day, right? And so this is the rate form, right? of the equation. Or it's also known as the transmissibility form, OK? And the reason that this is convenient is because ultimately, we're doing reservoir simulation to try to determine how much fluid we can extract from petroleum, you know, the reservoir. And so it's useful to have uh, this Q vector over here that has things in terms of rates so that we can then place wells in there that are either, you know, production wells to determine the rate of fluid that we're going to get out, or perhaps we want to have injection wells as boundary conditions as well. And so it's useful to have this Q uh, in rate form, okay? And so Now that we have it in rate form, we can go ahead and choose where we evaluate P, right? So if we evaluate P at P n, uh, the nth time step, then we end up with an explicit method. And if we solve for it, then ultimately we have p at n plus 1 is equal to p at n plus delta t b inverse. Q minus T P and N. 
Now, it may look like we have to, you know, we, we said that, you know, so again, this is the explicit method. And we said that the explicit method, we said before that the explicit method is easier because we don't have to solve a system of equations, but here you see this B inverse. Well, remember, B is a diagonal matrix, and the inverse of a diagonal matrix is just one over the diagonals. And so this, there's really no, you don't have to solve a system of equations here. You just take one over the diagonal entry, and that's how you get B inverse. So it's a very easy operation. And so this, this equation is in your explicit method, and if you evaluate P at P n plus 1, then solving for the result there, we have So now this whole matrix, which is not diagonal, right, because T is not diagonal, uh, then you'd have to take the real inverse of that guy. that. So this is the implicit method in transmissibility form. And again, the purpose for doing this is so that we have this Q vector so that the equations are in terms of rates and we can add wells to either produce or uh, inject fluid into it. 